right. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 4. Today our passage, we're going to read from verse 23 through 31. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles on the seat backs, and then there, the scripture is going to be placed behind me on the screen as well. Acts chapter 4, verse 23 through 31. It says, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against you are your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your, to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. That is the word of the Lord. Amen. All right, so last Sunday, uh, we covered uh, the beginning of chapter 4, and I spoke to you about the faithfulness of God to embolden his people for the trials that they face. Now, in the text that we have been studying all the way back to the beginning of chapter 3, uh, we see Peter and John, how they perform this miraculous healing, and then they endure persecution for doing the work of God. And their work, which was the healing of the lame beggar, was accepted, uh, but the the power in which it was done was not accepted. In other words, uh, the work, the healing itself was accepted by the religious uh, leaders and and, and the people because it was a wonderful thing that was done. And and of course, um, it was something that was impressive, unexplainable. It was a miracle, so to speak. And so they accepted the healing, the work, but the name of Jesus, uh, they did not accept, or by the power of the name of Jesus, it was not accepted in that name. In fact, they didn't want the apostles to teach in that name or mention that name or associate that name with the healing that had taken place. I think that's a great lesson for us as we look at this, because uh, there's one thing that we understand about the world is that the world is... And when I say the world, I mean the, the worldly concepts, the, the, the thought, the society as, as we see it, uh, the world that is without God. The world is willing to receive the goodness that comes from God. There, there's no issue there. We see that every single day. They're willing to receive the goodness. We as Christians believe that all good things come from our, from our Father up above. The fact that we, that we live today, the fact that we breathe, the fact that we have the things that we have, uh, that we're well equipped, that's all from the Father, and the world is willing to accept that, but they are not willing to proclaim that God is good. So they're willing to accept the good things from God, but they do not want to proclaim that God is good. Um, in fact, they don't want to proclaim God at all. And But that's where we come in. We are heralds of the truth, and we are ambassadors for Christ, the Bible tells us. Now, But Peter and John, they were heralds of the truth and ambassadors for Christ. And we see that here, and and in a sense, that's who we follow. We follow Christ, but we also follow these other biblical men who follow Christ. That's what Paul tells us to do. Follow me as I followed Christ. So it's good for us to look at this example and this story here to see how they they handled persecution and, and, and what their response to it was. Well, Peter and John... 
were threatened by the Jewish religious authority to not, uh, to not speak in the name of Jesus anymore. But what was awesome is that they did not cave to the temptation to desert Christ. And I would say to desert Christ again because they had failed just a, 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 a few uh, days before. Instead, here they stand firm, emboldened by the Holy Spirit to speak the truth despite the threats that were aimed at them. They were released by the authorities and they were reunited with their family of faith. And then once they're reunited with their church, this is where we pick up on in verse uh, 23. We get to see their response to the threat of further persecution because they were already captured, put into jail, uh, threatened, and then they were released. So they suffered some minor persecution in a sense that they were just put in jail for, for one night, but uh, they were threatened with further persecution. And, and, and we get to see the faithfulness of God uh, who sustains them through this temptation to desert the name again, to walk away uh, from the faith because they are being persecuted. Uh, here's the, the sermon summary. This is what I would like for you to walk away from when you, after you hear this sermon. Um, because it, and this is why it's important. It points to the sovereignty of God and the faithfulness of God. That's what these passages point to. Uh, believers should be emboldened through life because God is sovereign and faithful. Let me repeat that again. Believers should be emboldened through life because God is sovereign and faithful. Right? That's the truth that I'd like for you to focus on as you continue to hear this passage explained uh, because it's a, it's a wonderful truth about our Christian life and what God has uh, done for us and what will continue to do for us. Uh, when we look at this passage, there are several points to it and each point gives us an example of, of, of the believer's faith in God. And, and, and how much they trusted in God and relied upon God. And then we actually see how God responds to that in the final section of our passage. Uh, the very first thing that we see in our passage is how the believers responded to persecution with praises to God. Um, people talk a good game, right? Uh, we, we can talk about how we would uh, accomplish something or how we would react to something when we are or were in a given situation. But um, what we do is what really matters. We can talk about how we would handle something, but what we do is how what really matters. Um, here, the apostles were facing persecution. Uh, as I told you before, they were put into jail overnight. Uh, they were questioned in front of the Sanhedrin. They were threatened. And so basically, they're in it. They're in that moment. Um, and so to speak, they're in that moment, and their response to the threat of further persecution, uh, we should look at it as admirable. Uh, we should also look at it as humbling and also edifying. Uh, admirable because of what they were able to accomplish. Humbling because you have to question yourself and say, could I have done the same thing? And then edifying because it teaches us something about human nature and also about God. Uh, Look at the passage. It says that when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. That's the first response that we see um, that comes from that passage is that they were threatened. They went back to their friends. They told them the story and they all heard it. And they, speaking of all them who were there, lifted their voices together to God. When you see the phrase lifted their voices to God, that's, that's an example or that's basically saying in other passages that's saying that they praised God for something. Here they praised God for being able to um, endure the threat of persecution. Now, the fact that they responded to persecution with praises to God is pretty amazing. And it also shows growth on their part especially speaking about Peter. Let's just use Peter as an example. Um, we know how Peter failed the Lord. He denied him, right? And in denying him, uh, he betrayed God. But here, we see him standing firm in his faith. 
Now, when we look at that, we can't give Peter the credit. We have to give the credit to the Holy Spirit because Peter wasn't able to do this before. The Holy Spirit inhabits him. Um, then we start to see the work of the Holy Spirit. He becomes bold in his preaching. Uh, he becomes bold in, 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 his, in, in his facing opposition, standing up to untruth. And it's awesome to see this, this, this change in Peter. Well, again, we point to the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit for that. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, I bring up that verse because the cowardness that the apostles once had before was replaced with boldness to speak the name. Now, there's a lesson there for us um, as Christians. We who belong to Christ, when we are empowered by God, uh, or when we are inhabited by God, indwelled by God, by the Holy Spirit, then we have the power to break free of our past bondages. That's what's so awesome about it. Because the scripture says that those who have the indwelling Holy Spirit, the old has passed away and the new has come. They are new creations. So just because you suffered from a particular sin before you were a Christian doesn't mean that you have to continue to walk in that sin after you become a Christian. Um, You yourself don't have the power to overcome that bondage, but through the indwelling Holy Spirit, God has the power to overcome that sin for you. Now, instead of retracting in fear, the apostles were able to praise God despite their unfavorable circumstances. And the reason is found in our text. Look at verses 24 through 28. It says, when they had heard it, speaking about the story, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against you, your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now, I I reread that passage because it's important for us to know what the believers were thinking back then. And their response here, uh, the response that is is captured in Scripture here gives us some great detail about where they were in their faith. The believers were able to praise God for their uh, trials because they believed that he was sovereign. That's it, plain and simple. When you believe that God is sovereign... It changes everything about your faith. It changes your whole outlook in life. Now, the problem with us is that we have to continue to remind ourselves that God is sovereign. Because of sin, we go back to the thought that we are uh, in charge of our destiny, so to speak. Right? We we believe that lie, that, that we ourselves are the captain of the ship, that we can control what happens to us and what doesn't happen to us. The fact is, we are created by a sovereign God. The creation is not greater than the creator. The creator rules over the creation. And we have come to that knowledge, and because we have come to that knowledge, life lot simpler. It should be. Life is life is precious. But life is a lot more secure when you come to the knowledge that you serve a sovereign God. The believers were able to praise him for their trials because they believed God was sovereign. This text gives us some insight into their theology concerning the sovereignty of God. First of all, they quoted Psalm 2. And 
because Psalm 2 is quoted here, it reflects that they believe that the arrest, the torture, and the crucifixion of Christ were foreordained by God. That's exactly why that was quoted there. They were pointing out to each other. Now, mind you, these, this is a, a room, if you will, of believers hearing a story of persecution. Then they lift up their voices together to praise God. And then someone quotes Psalm 2, and then they begin to praise God out of Psalm 2. They're not evangelizing here. They're speaking to themselves. They're praising God, and, and they're hearing this. This is just a, a church body hearing this. And they're reminding themselves that Christ was not defeated. That, that, that the enemy didn't get the best of God. Rather, they're reminding themselves that in his sovereignty, God the Father sent the Son to die for those who love him. That's what they're reminding themselves of when they quote Psalm 2. And, and they also, it's a reminder that nothing that happened to Christ happened outside of the will of God. See, although those who were guilty of putting to death the Son of God acted according to their own will, they, they did nothing outside of the will of the Father. Nothing. I'll say that again because I think that's very impactful. Although those who were guilty of putting to death the Son of God acted according to their own will, they did nothing outside of the will of the Father. What they meant for evil, God meant it for good. When Psalm 2 says, He who sits in the heavens laughs, and the Lord holds them in derision, man, that, that just brings goosebumps to my arms. Because here we go, we have these men who think they're going to crucify Christ, get rid of him, get rid of the cause, right? Get rid of everything that goes along with Christ. And yet, God laughs at their plans. He says, no, this was a part of my plan. You're, you're falling into it. This is exactly what I wanted to happen because this would free my people for all time. See, they acknowledge that Jesus was not defeated. Rather, he was victorious in achieving the Father's will. That's why verses 27 and 28 are very important in this passage. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. What awesome faith. What great theology. So many have it mixed up nowadays. There's, there's all kind of beliefs about God, but a lot of these beliefs, they, they try to strip God of his sovereignty. And unless we look at God as completely sovereign and in control of all things, then we have the wrong God that we're worshiping. Because the God of the Bible is sovereign in every way. The God of the Bible gave his son to be a sacrifice for us. As we see this church, this early church, praising God for the persecution that they are enduring, and they're pointing back to the cross, and they're saying, thank you, God, for giving your son all that was according to your plan, all that was by your hand. Man, that teaches us a very important lesson on how we should look at life. And especially how we should look at things that happen to us. See, the believers, their praises to God were a product of their trust in God. If you don't believe that God is in control of all things, 
and that he works all things according to his will, then you will struggle to stand firm in your faith. You will struggle with that for the rest of your life until you come to that acknowledgement that God is sovereign. He is above all things. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. This is one of the great lessons of life. And this is something that we continually have to remind ourselves. This fact is true for everything. It's true for his church. We, We might look at the church today, so to speak, at least the visible church, and we might scratch our head and we might say, man, what kind of state is the church in today? But the thing is, is that many of the churches that we're looking at aren't the real church. When we look at the real church, it is strong and vibrant. Why? Because God nurtures it. Because God adds to it. Because God is protecting her. That is his bride. The real church is strong. The real church is growing. And the real church will be revealed one day by God himself. So when we look at everything and we we look with our physical eyes, we might get worried about something because we're like, wow, what kind of state is that thing in? But nothing is beyond God. He's working in the details. He's doing things that we cannot see. But see, that's not only true for an example like the church, That's also true for, let's just say, your marriage. There there are a lot of things that maybe in the past, maybe right now you're going through a difficult time in your marriage, or maybe there's something lying in the future that's going to cause you to question what is going to happen in your relationship with your spouse. The fact is, we point back to the sovereignty of God again. If not your marriage, I guarantee your kids. Amen? Amen? Your marriage is going great. It doesn't matter. There's always, if you have more than one kid, there's always a kid to worry about. And you sit there and you wonder, like, what's going to happen to them? Who are they going to be? What's this world going to be like when they grow up? Right? You continue to wonder, how are they going to make it? But yet, if they worship the sovereign God that you worship, no worry at least there shouldn't be a worry because just like God has blessed you just like God has protected you provided for you guided you he will do the same for them so yes there's so many things there you could have your job that you worry about or how about this this is the time what what time are we in right now election time we go back to this is the most important election of our lifetime. We say that every four years. And every four years, we put a, a, a man in office who is flawed, who doesn't do the will of God, who is even, who's not even worried about doing the will of God, and yet we place all of our faith in that one man. Our faith, And our trust should be placed in God alone. That's the awesome thing about this passage. These believers were able to praise God because they trusted a sovereign God. And it wasn't just this moment. As we continue through study the book of Acts, you're going to see moment after moment after moment. These believers are, they they see horrible things. They experience horrible horrible things and their response to this is always praises to God makes me feel pretty bad right because if if there's a a challenge or two in in one week I'm just walking around my head down and I'm like I'm just the most persecuted person ever how can I endure this God God help me take this away from me right I mean that that's kind of the reaction And yet, these people are able to praise God for the most horrible thing 
that could happen to them. It's awesome to see. And as I said, it's edif- it should be edifying for you and I. Also, the believers responded to persecution with prayer. So with first with praise and then with prayer. Notice that this is a long prayer here, and part of their prayer is praise. In fact, that's the beginning part, but then they transition to petitions. So they respond to persecution with petitions to God. The believers, they trusted in the Lord to continue, uh, excuse me, the believers trusted in the Lord uh, that he would continue to shine through all this opposition as they transition from praises to petitions. The fact that the believer's first response to trials was praises and petitions, again, is an important lesson for us. Since they believed that God was sovereign, they knew to go to him first and foremost for all things, or in all things. It reminds me of 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Looking closer at their prayer gives us insight into the enormity of their faith in God to provide for what they needed. They prayed for continued boldness. That's important. That's the first thing that we see. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. That's awesome. I I like to look at a passage sometimes and see what's there, but also think about what's not there. If that makes any sense. As I look at that passage and I I see them pray for boldness, it is awesome because I think about what I would have prayed for at that moment in time. And the very first thing that would have come out of my mouth is, God, take take this issue out of my life, right? Take this problem away from me. Of course, I would have said, but your will be done, not mine, Father, just to make it nice and neat. But I would have wanted for God to take that away. And so I would have prayed, God, remove this burden from me. That's not what's there. They didn't pray for God to remove the burden. They only prayed that they would endure it. How awesome is that? How about that theology? Right, because we have have people everywhere. We have people naming and claiming and, 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 and binding and unbinding and doing all this stuff and trying to remove everything and, and, and they do it all in the name of Jesus. But is that really what God wants us to do? Is that really how he wants us to pray? Think about this. If God is, 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 has brought this problem into your life to sanctify you, Why would he want you to pray to remove it if he's using it for his glory and and your good? And yet you're binding and claiming something that God is causing. It's, It's pretty amazing. But here they just, they looked at their problem and they said, Lord, help us endure it. In other words, Lord, help us bring honor and glory to your name as as we suffer persecution. They might have followed up with, hey, we don't enjoy this, but we know that since this is happening, this is your will, and we trust you. Secondly, when you look at their prayer, they not only believed, or they not only asked for continued boldness, but they believed that God would do his part. Look at verse 30. I'll I'll read 29 and 30 together, but focus on verse 30. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Now, verse 30. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They're like, Lord, give us boldness to endure this. While you do your work, because we already know you're going you're to do your work. 
don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm going through trials, much of my prayer time is spent hoping that God would move, hoping that God would do something. And you would think that after being in ministry for so long, I, I would already know that God is going to do something. But again, just like everyone else, I, I revert back to fear instead of faith. And when we're led by fear, it, it starts to cast doubt on what God will do or who God is. And we begin to pray God or begin to forget that God is faithful in all things. And we begin to wonder if God is even moving, if he's even doing anything. And when we do that, it's not honorable to sin against God because God has only shown us that he is faithful. We have no right to ever think that he will not be faithful. God has already promised that he is always moving. He is always working. It's not right for us to think that he's not. The Bible says God will never leave you nor forsake you. But he will always provide for your needs, Christ Jesus. Here's the lesson behind that. If we believe that God is sovereign, and we also believe that he hears our prayers, And there's only one response to that. We should pray without ceasing. Plain and simple. That's exactly what these believers are doing. They're enduring persecution. They believe God is sovereign. They believe he hears their prayers. Their first response to that persecution are praises and then petitions. We do not pray because we do not trust that either God is able or willing to change our circumstances. Then we lack faith. Then we're discouraged because we don't pray. You you see that connection? As a result, we become a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Let's change that. Let's change that by, number one, coming to the right theology about God. He's not waiting on us. He's not a weak God. He's not just love. Let's get all these misconceptions out of our head and let's read the Bible and Trust what the Bible says about God is true. God is loving, but he's holy. The devil is not equal to God. God is sovereign over everything. He has created everything. Everything was made through him and for him. God God hears our prayers. And if we believe that this sovereign God who loves us, who gave his son for us, hears our prayers, then why aren't we praying? That's the fall back on we just don't believe. There's something missing. There's something that we don't believe about what God has said about himself. We don't believe that he's either willing or he's faithful. Again, that is you, that is a sin against God. And let me remind you, that is all of us. That is all of us. We all stand guilty of that. When we look at that passage, the very last thing we see, we see the two responses from uh, the believers, but then we see God and how he answered the believers' prayers and how he encouraged them. The very last verse of this passage shows us that God is always faithful to do what is right and to do what is best. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. We see a direct answered prayer. They they prayed, God, fill us with boldness so that we can endure this 
trial and ends up with that they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, the shaking that we see in this passage was most likely an earthquake or at least a, a, a tremor, but it wasn't to harm them. I, I can't imagine that, we, that, that they sit there and they're praying and then everything just, just imagine that happening here. It just starts shaking everywhere. It wasn't to harm them, though. It served as a sign of God's faithfulness to his people. When you see the term or the phrase filled with the Spirit, we, we see that used time and time again, and it's used before a, like a, a miracle or a wondrous act. And the author uses that phrase so that we can understand who that miracle is from. The power behind what is happening. Because we see these apostles as instruments, as vessels, but there is a power that is behind everything that is taking place, and it's not them, it is God. So filled with the Holy Spirit, because of the Holy Spirit, because of the power of God, because of his presence in them, they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. You remove the Holy Spirit, you have nothing. There is no boldness. Same is true for us. We are filled with the Spirit of God to do the things that God has called us to do. The sovereign God of all creation not only heard their prayers, but he answered them. Listen, one of the great claims of the church is that God is the same, right? The God that we read about in the Bible is the same God today. In fact, we claim that he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And since he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, listen to this, church, we can trust that he does the same for us, that he answers our prayers. Even better than that, he answers our prayers according to his will and not ours. Here's the conclusion of it all. In times of trials, we must trust God. That's where it starts. We must trust him. He is sovereign. He is in control. So we have no other choice but to trust him. It's either trust God or trust yourself. If you continue to trust yourself, you're going to continue to have problems and standing firm in your faith. So, in times of trials, we must trust God, and we must pray that he equips us to endure the trial that is set before us. Don't just go get on your knees and pray that God take it away. God is using it for his glory and your good. Rather, pray that you can endure it. To bring Pray that you can bring praises to his name and that you can please him through you enduring the, the trial. But we also have to understand that the Lord will always be faithful in answering our prayers according to his will. I'm going to read this passage for you and close with it. Psalm 25, this is 8 through 10. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Let us pray.